think uh, web components are super exciting. It's a game changer in the way we develop for the web. Uh, and hopefully by the end of tonight, you see a little bit of what I'm going to show you, and Matt's going to demo some really cool stuff. You'll hopefully fall in love with this stuff uh, just as much as I have. So a little bit about myself, uh, so you know who's yapping at you up here. My name is Eric Beidelman, and I'm a developer programs engineer at Google, which basically means I come out, I speak to developers, I talk to them about really cool stuff on the web platform. The new hotness is web components, so that's really what I'm excited about these days, and that's what I'm kind of focusing on. Um, there's totally a lot of stuff to learn. Uh, I think there's you know, a number of new APIs coming to the browsers near you. Um, so if you want to learn more about all this stuff that I'm going to kind of cover at a, at a very high level, Check out HTML5 Rocks. There's a lot of really good detailed articles there, tutorials. Um, you, know, you can also feel free to ping me at any time, at eBottles, Twitter. Um, I'm on Google+. There's a blog. Don't go there. I never write there. There's not much happening. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of stuff sort of thrown at your face in the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, if you want to know more about Polymer and follow us, at Polymer is our, is our Twitter, Twitter handle. So feel free to, to hit that up. So what's the need for web components? How many people have even heard of web components? Oh, awesome, sweet. OK, my job is, uh, is totally done here. Um, but they're actually solving some really, really interesting problems um, when developing for the web. Um, how many people have been like, a web developer for more than like, 10, 15 years? All right, so you guys have learned like, all the cruft that the web has brought, like, all these crazy APIs. Over the years, things have changed quite a bit. This is a problem, right? This is a real problem. Um, once upon a time, you kind of have to understand where we've come from in order to understand where we're going. So once upon a time, right, this is, this is our web platform. This is really cool. So yeah. it's been pieced together like over the years, like, you know, people have some duct tape, a tape measure, like somebody's nailed in the, uh, the corners of our, our platform. And over time, what happened was, oh my gosh, we got HTML5. Like, this is going to solve all the problems of web development. It's going to bring us all these APIs. It's going to cure cancer, like you insert, whatever. Um, and it's totally going to work. And yes, we got, a, we got a lot of stuff, right? We got geolocation and all these new capabilities. Um, so our platform, as, as web developers, uh, got much more mature. We could do much, much more with it. And then over, ha over time, what happened in the last you know, three years or whatever, we, we started adding more and more and more awesome stuff. So this is things like WebGL and WebRTC and some really, really awesome, capable APIs <laughs> that the web platform needed in order to you know, compete and really do well. Um, but what, what about us like regular developers? Right? This, is, this feels like overkill. Like how many people use the web audio API every day? No one. How many people write JavaScript every day and HTML every day? I, I do myself. So what about us regular developers, right? Like what, what developer productivity tools are, are the browser vendors building in for us? Not just these slick APIs that do really, really awesome stuff, but, but what are like the low level primitives that we can, we can build our you know, complex applications on top of? So this is where the Web Components kind of journey started. It started actually four years ago. This is a long time ago. Um, and so Dmitry Glaskov, I, I consider him like the godfather of Web Components. So he and a few others at Google got together and started brainstorming, like, what, what does the web platform need in order to make developers more productive? What are we missing? What are the, what are the APIs? And so he sent this email to, to the public web apps mailing list like four years ago saying, hey, you know, a few of us have been thinking about some things we should add that Every you know, modern platform out there has things like templating and data binding. Um, Shadow DOM, right? This is being able to encapsulate and scope certain DOM to a very particular area. And this is, like, this is what started it all. And actually, it's really kind of cool to look back and see this. Like, not much has changed. We've, we now have templating. We now have Shadow DOM. This is what Web Components is bringing to the table. So that was where the journey started. So they, they were like, hey, you know, we have this awesome you know, HTML5, all these new capabilities. Let's think about what we can do to strip that back. Let's, let's take it to the bare minimum. What APIs can we identify that are going to make the next generation of framework, the next generation of web applications? And so this is where like, the web component sort of specifications were born, um, thinking through the, these issues. And what's really cool about the, all these APIs is they're really useful, each and every one by themselves. But together, they really form like a cohesive story as far as building components for the web. So developers can you know, tweak and do whatever they want. They can build the next generation of Ember or Angular or w insert whatever framework you want on top of these primitives. That's really what this is all about, is standardizing the way we do stuff. All right. So web components, to me, they're a set of emerging standards that allow developers uh, to extend HTML and to tell the browser essentially about new markups, new tags, and also give it extra functionality. So whatever you want to do, whatever you can dream up, you can tell the browser about. And essentially, it's exactly like that tag existed in the browser uh, natively. That's what web components are. 
And it's really, really important, I can't emphasize enough, like, Everything you're going to see today about Polymer, about X tags, whatever web component library is out there, it's all based on these standards. It's, they're all W3C standards. So there's standards at the bottom of all this cool magic stuff we've, we've done in Polymer. So what are those standards? So the, there's four main ones when we talk about web components. Uh, the first is templates. So I'm going to try to live code this. So this is a new tag. This is a new tag we get for free in the browser. We can use this, and anything that goes inside of this tag is essentially inert. We can scaffold out sections of DOM and then clone those and use those for later. So it's proper templating, finally, in the browser. There's no kind of crazy string hacks. Custom elements. So being able to actually tell the browser, I want to declare this, this x-tabs new tag or this crazy scaffold tag, you can do that. You can tell the browser about this new element, you can give it an API, and then people can use and call that API. Shadow DOM. This is really, really cool. So the, for the first time ever, we have the ability to actually scope CSS to a component. So any styling you put in a web component, any markup you put in a web component is all encapsulated and, and logically um, part of that component. So this is really great, right? If you, if you build a component, you don't want styles to leak out. You don't want your page styles to bleed in and affect the way you know, your, your hard-earned uh, styling and your markup has been presented. And last one is really cool. It's it's very simple API. So this is the ability to use the link tag, but instead of link rel style sheet, we have link rel import. And so I can give this thing an HTML file, and that HTML file can be included in my page. It contains JavaScript, it contains markup, it contains CSS. So it's a great way to bundle, you know, if you're th building a component with all these different pieces, bundle all that up and then deliver that to end users. So it's a great way to share web components and for others to then distribute web components. So all these together, again, can be totally used by themselves. You can use the template tag by itself. You can use Shadow DOM by itself. But really, when you package all this together, which is what, which is what Polymer has done, and we're re totally like relying on this stuff. We really believe in it. Um, that's when things get really magical. Browser support. You know, this is the biggest question we always get. When is this stuff going to land in that one browser? Um, browser support is actually pretty good. This was totally different a year ago. So this stuff is moving very, very fast. Um, and you can see some up-and-comers, like Firefox is implementing a lot of these. As we speak, there's open bugs for each of these APIs. But through the magic of polyfills, right, thanks JavaScript, we can actually uh, polyfill all of these. So there's no excuse in 2014 not to try and use web components. Um, all of it is available via uh, the polyfills the Polymer team has put together. So that's the platform. That, that's the core APIs when we talk about web components. I want to focus on custom elements. I think this is really sort of the foundational piece of what we're, we're trying to do. To, or, to understand this, you actually have to take another journey back in time. So this is today, and we'll you know, take our time machine uh, back to 1980 when the web or Google, at least Google, looked like this. So it's very primitive, very simple. And your web app looked like this, right? This is really cool. This is like state of the art at the time. Uh, you know, the browser looked a little different, and a web application at the time was a form, right? That's all we really had. We had markup. Um, you could input your name. You could input your last name. There was this little cool select tag that had this like magical drop-down widget thing. That's kind of cool. I just declare some stuff on my page, and I get that for free. Radio buttons and the submit form. That was a web app. That's all we had. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Clippy, Clippy, <laughs> or sorry, Selecty. <laughs> Selecty is Clippy's cousin. He's going he's gonna to help us build a web page on the internet. This is exciting. Um, so back then, right, elements were declarative, and everything was an element. So we only had markup. We didn't really have JavaScript or CSS. We just had markup. And we had forms. We had selects. Select is a really good example of sort of conceptualizing web components. Uh, it's super declarative, right? I declare this little thing on my page, select. I throw in some option tags. And somehow, magically, the browser knows to render this magical component. So this is like the first example of a component. It's just native to the browser. It's part of the native UI. And it's got you know, check marks for the things that are selected. It's got these hover states when I, when I interact with it. And it's got this drop down. And all I do is, again, declare this on my page, and I get all of this default UI for free. That's pretty cool. It's really simple to use as a user. These elements are, were also configurable at the time. So if you take select again, right? if you put a disabled attribute on option or a selected attribute on the option tag, this actually is meaningful. This does something. So I'm not writing any JavaScript to interact with this thing. The browser is just magically knowing to you know, disable those first couple options. And then that last one is selected by default. So this is cool because Selecty is saying, hey, we're, we're configuring this thing, right? this, this widget, this component, via attributes, just regular markup and not script. It's super intuitive. You know exactly what is happening by reading this. right? 
And attributes can also you know, exist on other elements. If you, if you move them one level up and you, and you actually put them on select, you give it a size 4 and you give it the multiple attribute. Now we don't have that drop down anymore. We actually have you know, a multi-select widget. So based on the things I actually configure this, this widget, this select with, it's changing the way it renders itself. Somehow magically, totally transparent to us, um, but that's super cool. These things are also composable. So what does that mean? Well, select, right, you can throw in option tags. That's one thing it, it knows how to deal with. But you can also throw in the op grouped element, right? So if you want to, you can actually group different things together. So this is cool. It doesn't only recognize selects. It actually does something different based on the fact that we give it a different element, a different tag. So you can imagine these things being composed over time and different elements reacting based on the children elements that are, are contained inside of them. Selecty's super excited about this one. Um, and select itself, right? You can compose this into a larger application as well. You can put select inside of a form, and you know some black magic happens. All of a sudden, like when you submit this form, uh, the size the size parameter gets submitted with that form. So the browser is smart enough to know somehow how to deal with that. So that is pretty sweet. Elements have APIs as well, right? Not everything makes sense in markup. I'm certainly not saying that. Um, but take select again as an example, right? When interesting things happen, when someone selects something out of that, those options, uh, you, get a, you get a change event, right? So if this thing fires events. It does something useful. And it also has things in JavaScript, like a selected index property or an options array that you can get at and you can tweak, right, if you need to. And so there's other capabilities here. Not everything makes sense in markup, so you might need some extra power under the hood. So what happens? This, this seems pretty cool. Like, this is really easy, intuitive to use as a web developer. Well, this happened. This totally happened in a major way. This is, uh, if you open up the dev tools, this is Gmail, right? One of, I think, one of the, the most sophisticated web apps out there. Um, and you open it up, you look at the, the element inspector, and you see a bunch of divs. That's awesome. We call this div soup, right? Div soup. I don't know how to read this. You know, I don't know how to maintain this. As a developer, I have no idea what this, what this means even. I know they've purposely obfuscated some of this, but um, it's just, it's not semantic. It doesn't actually describe what the application is doing, and that's terrible. This uh, and the other side of the fence too, right? In the JavaScript world, we said, okay, markup's not going to like do the things we need it to do. It's not going to keep up with the application of today. So let's just write, you know, a crap ton of JavaScript to to fill the need. This is an example of um, Google Plus's photo application. So we just kept piling, piling on more and more JavaScript. A really, really good example of this is if you just look at a tabs component, right? This is like the quintessential sort of component that every UI framework out there has, right? A little tabs widget. So what happened over the years um, is that we started with a bunch of markup, right? We have divs. We, we've given it maybe a, some, some fragment IDs to kind of signify what to tab, right? And at the bottom, we write a little bit of JavaScript that says, OK, somehow magically go fetch this thing out of the DOM, you know, call this tabs constructor, and, and render yourself somehow into like, this tab strip widget. And so what's happened over the years if, is we've progressively gotten away from that. Um, so as, as time went on, right, everyone, I don't care what framework you are, developed their own way to write a tabs component. Um, so as a, as a web developer, right, like I have no idea how, I have to go learn each of these different APIs. They're all different. Some have more markup than others. Some use more JavaScript than others. But this is really daunting, right? And so the problem with web is that there's been no standard way to actually create components. Frameworks have to roll their own solutions. And so that is where web components come in. It's standardizing this ability to be able to, to actually use the same APIs under the hood to create your component system. Here's a, a really primitive example of a web component, right? Instead of writing all that crazy markup in JavaScript, you as a user, as a developer, you're dropping in the X tabs tag on your page. You fill it with some X tabs with you know, whatever is supposed to be part of those panels. And that's how, uh, this is like the future of your tabs component. And that's how easy it is. Maybe a more practical example is something like Google Maps, right? This is a really awesome, complex JavaScript API. But you can imagine this in the world of web components, where it's all declarative. And I'm not writing actually any JavaScript. I'm just plopping this, this Google Maps tag on my page. And voila, what, what you get is, of course, a map, right? You just declare this on your page. And under the hood, somehow, it's, it's generating that map using the JavaScript API. So just as in the case of select, right, we can write a web, we can create the Google Map web component tell the browser about it, and it can be configured using attributes, just like the select, right, with disabled and, and selected. So in this case, this Google Map element knows uh, about the latitude and longitude attributes that you give it. And when you do that, when you declare them, of course, it centers itself on those latitude and longitude, just as you would expect. 
Uh, it's got a zoom attribute that we can use to configure it as well. So you know, when I set zoom equals 15, it does that somehow under the hood using the, the API calls. But again, as a user, I'm just this is where I declare my page, and I get this for free. Uh, we talked about composability, right? With select, you can drop in options, and you can drop in op group tags. With the Google Map tag, you can drop in Google dash map dash marker. So this is a, an element that knows how to render a Google marker to the map, the underlying map it's in. So that's significant, right? Because the fact that this tag is within this, this Google Map tag means that, hey, you should be rendering this marker to that location. And you can totally read this. You know exactly what this application is doing. Another thing I want to point out is that you know, we actually have the, the capability now to reuse other parts of the web platform. So if you look at this, this marker tag, you have the title attribute, right? This is a standard HTML attribute that you can put on almost any uh, HTML tag. And we can use that in, in this as well when we're creating custom elements, when we're creating web components. And I apologize if you, if you guys can't see in the live stream or back there, but I've rendered the Google Map marker to use that title right on the outside. Somebody declares this. It makes the underlying API call under the hood for me, but I don't, I don't care how the Google Maps API works. I just use it like this. Another thing it's doing is I set the draggable, the HTML5 uh, drag and drop API, draggable to true, which allows me to drag this marker. It knows how to update itself and to you know, uh, allow itself to be draggable under the hood. And we can add a bunch of different um, you know, markers to this. This one happens to be off screen, right, at the, the giant stadium there, way over there. Um, but we can fix this right, really easy. We can expose this as a declarative API to users. Um, if I want, I can add the ability for users to specify shrink to markers. This is an attribute, an awesome way to configure this. And then any time I add a marker child to this map, it just knows to do the right thing. right? So it's a totally declarative API surface for that underlying um, API call in the Maps API. So that's really powerful stuff, right? This is sort of my vision of the future of, of how to use the Google Maps API. I think it's a really powerful one. So this enables a lot, a lot of stuff when you think declaratively and, and less imperatively. The first is, like you've seen, right? You can declare things. And everything you saw is super descriptive. You know exactly what it's supposed to do based on its configuration and its attributes that, that you're seeing declared. Things are composable. So you can imagine you know, creating a component that does something very, very particular, but then composing that and using that and reusing that in other contexts uh, to get different functionality. That's what you saw with the maps marker element. Scoping is like the coolest like, like underdog feature, I think, when we talk about all this stuff. Scoping is really, really awesome. For the first time ever, we have the ability to scope CSS to a component. So again, things don't bleed out, and your page styles don't bleed in. This is really, really awesome. Um, ha we've never had that ability before unless you're using something like an iframe, which is totally heavyweight um, and, and not really the, the correct solution for something like this. The other piece of this is the ability to define an API in an element, right? You can call and, and users can tap into that API. So you're not, you're not building applications so much in the global namespace anymore. You're kind of thinking about a very particular problem, creating a component for it, and then people can use that API that you've, you've created. So this opens up new ways to think about HTML. Like we've kind of like you know pushed it under the rug because it hasn't really done anything for us for so long. But but now we as developers can actually you know tell it to do whatever we want. We can define new vocabulary for uh, the browser. It's really important to think about sort of what exists today and sort of what we can build in the future. So I want you to to think about this. This is like a really good example of some of the the UI elements, right? Things if you declare on your page like the input tag or the select uh, tag. Progress elements, a new thing in HTML5, very cool. Uh, button, you know, the video player has this really magical little control widget that, uh, that we get for free just by declaring a, a video tag. These things all render UI, right? As a user you know, of this web page, I can see these. These are visual to me. They, they represent something. But there's this whole sort of other side to, to markup and to HTML that we don't really think about. Uh, but you use every day, right? You use things like the title tag and the link tag and the style tag. These are things that don't actually render anything to the user, to the browser, but they're important to us as developers, right? We use these. So for instance, like the script tag, right? Whatever you put inside of it, it knows, the browser knows to do something with that. And what it does is it evaluates JavaScript and runs that under the hood. So we can do the exact same thing, right, with custom elements if you're building a web component. Here's an example, uh, Firebase element that uh, the Polymer team has created. Uh, we thought Firebase is really cool, so why not wrap it up in a web component, some of that functionality? If someone declares the Firebase element on their page, they give it a location, um, and you can tell it to handle as JSON or, or vice versa. And this is really cool because I'm not writing any code. I'm just literally declaring this on my page. And then attaching events. 
So all of your same tricks apply in the world of web development, right? Add event listener, query selector, it's all part of this. Uh, because ultimately what we're doing is just telling the, uh, the browser about a new DOM element. Another example is geolocation. I can configure it with a watch position, a high accuracy attribute, and under the hood, it's doing all those crazy you know, multiple levels of, of callbacks that the geolocation API has. But as a user, I'm just listening for that geo response event and then you know, using its latitude and longitude. So an entirely new way uh, in the description here, a declarative surface area for actually interacting with libraries and APIs and services. What this actually reigns in is a whole new opportunity for interoperability. Um, and what I mean by that is you can imagine a case where you know, Mozilla, for instance, has their, their XTags library, which is a web components library that allows you to, to polyfill custom elements. You can imagine using their X flip box tag, which is just a tag that basically you put some content in, and when you click it, it just does a, a 360 or a 180. Right. You can imagine using that with uh, an element that's created using Polymer, a Polymer tabs element. And the fact that these are just DOM, the fact that it's just markup and the browser totally understands all that, means that these can interact very, very well with each other. For the first time, we have that ability to throw a bunch of stuff on the page and not have to worry about things kind of exploding. Um, so that's awesome. I, I, I say interoperability on by default. And because it's all DOM, because every framework out there understands it. Now this also means we have first class dev tool support, which is kind of cool too. Um, this is an example of our, our Polymer project.org website. And in that we have this little tabs component. It's actually implemented using Polymer. Um, and so if I click, you know, click around, you get a source view and you can click between the different, uh, the different views of the, the source code. But what's neat about this is since it's all markup, since it's all DOM, and you know, the, the dev tools actually know really, that stuff really, really well, you can open up the inspector, all right, and I can drill down into it. I can select nodes out of the DOM. I can poke around. Um, you know, I can actually bring up the console and you know, dynamically use its API. So I'm s sw switching this, uh, this element select attribute, and you can see it's updating the actual component because it's on the page. It's a first class citizen in, in the browser. I've, um, what else can I do? So I can, I can actually style this, right? I can use the DevTools inspector to actually style this because, it's, again, it's just markup. So we can use CSS just like we normally would. And you can poke around. You can discover its API. It's got a panels array that it exposes. It's got an updates panel function that I can call. So the fact that we can actually like, use the tools that are built into the browser now I think is, is actually really exciting. Something else we get is extensibility. Um, and I just want to briefly touch upon this, because I think it's actually really hard in like other frameworks. Uh, being able to extend from something, this is a, a really complex problem. So Polymer actually makes this even easier than like the native vanilla JavaScript way of doing this. Um, I'll take the, the Google Map example that you saw before. I actually didn't create that map uh, element. But what I did was I extended it to, to learn how to render markers on the map. So in Polymer, what you do is you create a new tag call it map with markers. Um, and it extends an existing tag. So it extends the Google map tag. And so then, now what I can do when I you know, implement the JavaScript under the hood is I can then use this tag exactly as you'd expect and exactly as you saw. So it's cool because I didn't, you know, I don't know anything about rendering a map or anything, but I do know how to extend it. And I, I was easily, um, I was very capable of doing that. Um, just without knowing the details of what somebody else did, I can, I can extend their stuff now. Another thing you can do is actually extend like, the native stuff in the browser as well. If you're not happy, and I don't, I don't know anybody that is, with the native controls like select and button, you can extend them using a custom element. So you can say, OK, button, you're going to be a super button using this is attribute. So you can imagine you know, adding uh, an API to the button or styling it differently. And so when somebody declares this on their page, they're going to get that like, super charged, super awesome button instead of the, you know, the crappy one that we have. So this is the new universe that we're creating with Web Components. I think it's a really, really awesome and exciting one. Uh, it's super declarative. It's interoperable. It's extensible. This is actually a, a demo of, what, of using Web Components. Um, John McCutcheon on the Dart team actually used the Polymer uh, Dart port. And he, he's got a WebGL library. And I know nothing about WebGL. I know nothing about 3D programming. But he wrapped all of his API calls in custom elements in HTML. And so you just declare this sort of 3D scene in markup and of course, I can go in here and edit these live in the dev tools, and it just knows right, to do the right thing. I'm not calling any WebGL. I'm just changing HTML to update the 3D scene, um, which is really, really cool. I think that's really powerful because, again, I, I'm not a 3D programmer. Uh, I can also go up. right? I can change one of these, these texture elements that he's created, and it just takes a source to an image. 
If I update that in the DevTools to point to a new source, uh, of course, the WebGL under the hood knows what to do. So Ron Swanson wants you guys to go componentize the web. He thinks this is super awesome. Um, I think it's super awesome. I'm going to throw it over to Matt um, to talk about Polymer in particular and, and show you some really cool demos. Feel free to, to hit me up on any of those channels, and I think we'll have time for, for Q&A afterwards, too. So thanks, guys. All right, so my name is Matt McNulty. I'm the lead manager for uh, Polymer, uh, which is part of the Chrome team at Google. Uh, so I work with Eric. Uh, formerly, I was part of WebOS. Uh, we wrote the Enyo framework, um, Aries tool, and worked on the touchpad and a bunch of stuff like that. Um, my Twitter handle's there if you want to hit me up. Uh, if you happen to be into period, really bad period dramas in the UK and you're a teenage girl, you might think I'm a different Matt McNulty. Uh, but that's not me, so feel free to uh, hit me up there and drown them out. So it is a nice ego stroke, though, because they say they love me all the time. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, so this is a bit of a live coding demo, even though I'm going to use a tool. So if I uh, make a typo or something like that, feel free to don't be shy, be interactive, and shout it out. Um, so this is a tool we wrote uh, in Polymer. Um, it's been kind of slowly evolving over the last year or so. It happens to just be a really good way of showing off web components and components in general. Um, but uh, you know, it's, again, it's not really like the Polymer thing that we're, we're pushing. It's just a tool that we use to show it off. Um, so Eric talked about the Google Maps uh, um, component that we have. And I figured I would actually just show how to build a little app using it, um, using Polymer. So we've got a, this is like your usual uh, 4GL IDE kind of thing. Um, so you've got a palette of components down the left-hand side, uh, a canvas in the middle, and then a property inspector on the right that lets you set things. Um, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Again, this is probably like a couple weeks of effort to build the tool. And we really just use it to show off Polymer. Um, and what's really cool is you can drag stuff off. And because components can be kind of arbitrarily complex, I can get something really cool like this whole app scaffold uh, just by dragging one thing off the palette. And if I go look at the code for this, it actually drags out this markup. Uh, which kind of matches what you saw in Eric's presentation uh, just from dragging that one thing out. Oops. All right, so we're going to build a little Maps app. So I brought out that scaffold, and I'll drag out a few other things. I'll drag out a search field because, you know, it's Google. you got to have search. It's required in every one of our demos. It's not actually true. <laughs> Come hit the text field and give you a little hint text. Uh, and you know, maps have satellite views and they have roadmap views. So we'll give a way to switch that around. And if I come up here in the components folder, I've got a Google Map element. This is exactly the same Google Map element that Eric was showing off. And I can tell it to maximize in there. And you can see we've got a Google Maps app. I can change the title around because I'm kind of a perfectionist. This is cool. The map, and you can see the properties that the map has as latitude and longitude, and a bunch of other things. And it has this map type, which lets you switch it around. Um, so this, you know, this the maps component has a metadata file that tells the designer what options it has, and that's how it's getting this information. But it also has this little link icon next to it. So instead of selecting that value as a developer, uh, you can use data binding to bind it to something else. So in this case, I'm going to take that menu that we've got and bind it to the selected value. So now if I switch back and forth, it's actually hooked up. So that's pretty cool. But again, we have a corporate mandate. We have to demonstrate search. So here, we drag out a search component. And this is one of those non-visual components Eric was talking about. Uh, so it didn't really show up on the screen, but it shows up down here in this little tree view. And in this case, I have to give it a pointer to the map element on the page just so it knows where to find it. And that's Google map, map. And we can actually set the search query to be bound to this text field that I put up here that says search in it. And set to the value property. All right. And then if I come back to the map. When we actually search for something, we want the map to go to it. So I'm going to set the latitude and longitude of the map uh, to the search results. 
So I go to the search component and I say result dot latitude. This is where you all have to be looking out for typos. And set the longitude to result dot longitude. So now if I come over here and I type Paris, you actually see that it's Paris. And it's all bound together. And I can save it. And this actually just created a polymer element with all that stuff in it. And I can actually preview it. And we have a little Google Maps app. And it's cool. It's got, if you shrink it down, I'm doing full screen. It would kind of screw things up if I shrink it down. It's uh, actually responsive, so the menu flips to something that's hidden on a phone size screen. And it's actually pretty cool. Um, but since this, this went off without a hitch, we'll try and expand things a little bit. I'm going to drag off a YouTube search video, maximize it, go up to the parent, arrange that a little bit better. And in this case, you can, you can bind a query to this I'm feeling lucky property, uh, which makes it so you have to be really tricky about what you demo, because you have no idea what's going to come up first on YouTube. <laughs> but generally, you're going to get cats, so it'll probably be OK. <laughs> And I can bind it to that same value. So now if you type in Paris, it shows you a walking guide of Paris. So that's pretty cool. When you come back to the code, you realize, hey, wait, this is actually just a, you know, about, what, 20 lines of code or so of markup. And you see lots of data binding and things like that that Eric was showing you in there. So that seems pretty cool. It seems like a very, very little code and actually no JavaScript at all, uh, just a single a shell of a prototype to Polymer. So, how did I do that? Polymer, that's why you're all here. <laughs> what is Polymer? It's a tool. No, it's not. <laughs> Polymer is a library utilizing web components for building elements and applications. Right? So Eric talked all about web components. Um, this Polymer is the first library to really use these things. Um, but really, what does that mean? That was a bunch of buzzwords in a sentence. So Polymer is a new kind of thing. Right? So actually, I was here you know, about an hour early. And someone, I got to witness someone asking what Polymer was at the back of the room. And I didn't turn around because I didn't want to spoil it because I wanted to hear what the other person said. Um, and they actually did a pretty good job of like, no, this isn't like things that have come before. Right? This is a different, different kind of thing. Um, this is the future. This is hoverboards. This is what we've been promised. right? And it's, it's kind of appropriate because it's, it's back to the future. right? Like Alex was, or, so Eric was talking about um, you know, select statements and building apps out of components again. It's really back to that future. Like you know, what you thought the HTML was going to be like back then. Um, the only thing out there that's even remotely similar right now is X tags, right? And we actually work with them pretty closely. Um, something that's not particularly well known, it's pretty, it's pretty hidden on uh, our websites, is uh, X tags uses the same polyfill library underneath that we wrote uh, to do their own stuff. Um, so Polymer uses web components. Eric did a pretty good job explaining that. And the big thing is Polymer doesn't paper over the platform, right? So the Polymer team is kind of the I want to say, you know, if I put it nicely, the resident web developer team on Chrome. Uh, captive would be maybe another term in certain days. Uh, so, you know, we're the guys, that, browser vendors actually typically, the people building the browser are actually not the people using the browser to develop on. There's very few web developers who also build browsers and vice versa. Uh, so we're kind of unusual in that way. So we were brought here uh, to Google and said, you know, we've got this new thing called Web Components. Um, we want to see if you guys can use it to build kind of the next generation of these things. See if you can build something that doesn't paper over the platform, that uses these new baked-in technologies uh, to, make, to make life simpler for developers um, and really use the native platform. Because the, the, you know, the hypothesis is the platform doesn't really need this anymore. So wait, wait, wait. Isn't Polymer a framework, isn't it? You know, just like AngularJS or Ember or whatever, all those things. Ha, ah, no. So this time the framework is actually DOM. So it's returning back to using the platform again. I'm going to say this like seven more times. And the component model, right? like Eric was talking about, the component model is custom elements in this case. So it's something that's provided natively. We don't actually have to create our own in JavaScript or anything else or on the server. Uh, we have custom elements on the page now, and that's our component model. And then scoping is provided by Shadow DOM. So people see the name Shadow DOM, and they hear encapsulation, and they think that this is like a really secure boundary. It's just something I want to point out. Um, Shadow DOM isn't secure. You're not running in a different JavaScript context. Um, it actually is just providing uh, scoping. So IDs are, similar, are, are scoped to the element. CSS is scoped to the element. You know, this is the introduction of classes to HTML, basically. 
Um, but you know, you can still poke in there and, and penetrate that boundary if you really have to. So it's not, not something for secure. So are you hating on frameworks? Um, no. We even wrote a bunch. So we wrote Enyo, people on the team wrote Dojo. Uh, so we've been in this for, for a really long time. We came to Google uh, to try and prove that, you know, use what we know to make it so no one ever has to do it again. Um, and there's a ton of great JS, JS frameworks out there right now. Um, you know, honestly, there's a lot of awesome developers who are building JS frameworks who could probably be building other things if the platform was just sufficient. Um, so we believe it's, you know, it's kind of time to change that. So polyfills. So a little note about polyfills. So we have all these polyfills so you can use web components today, right? It makes Eric's slide look really pretty. It kind of shows everything off. And that's really what it is. It's a bridge to make it so that you can use these things today in browsers that don't otherwise support them uh, using JavaScript. There are a ton of work. They're actually all we worked on for about the first 10 months up until just before I.O. last year. Um, so because they were a lot of work and because we had worked on them for so long, when we first started showing off Polymer, that was most of what we had. So a lot of people assume that, that that's what Polymer was. But Polymer is actually not the polyfill. The polyfills are things that are supposed to go away that aren't really specific to Polymer at all. Um, so even though we built them, they're not Polymer. And polyfills, the other important bit, everyone always asks me about oh, what's the performance of blah, blah, blah polyfill on X browser. And the thing is, if you could write a polyfill that was really, really performant, there'd be no need for the native feature. Um, so the real goal of polyfills is compatibility. Now, it turns out you know, the, the performance isn't that bad on polyfills, uh, depending on the browser and situation. It's actually quite good. Uh, but you know, again, it's not really the focus. The focus is so that developers, you guys can write once and run it across all these browsers as the native features are shipped. All right, so let's talk about Polymer some more. So Polymer is a sugaring layer. Uh, you can use it to build elements or apps. You saw that. You saw I was using Polymer elements to build an app just previously. Um, so web components are really, really awesome. Why do we have to build Polymer? So web components, like native primitives, are primitive by design, right? You want, as developers, we want the browser vendors to supply us with the lowest level, most powerful thing that they can, uh, that then we can take and do a, do the most expressive thing we can at with it. Uh, we don't want, you know, if when browser vendors try and build really high-level APIs, they end up being really restrictive or broken or, or you know, they don't, uh, they don't unlock usage as much as they could. Um, so using all these things together on their own, you, you can, you can you know, use web components today in Chrome, and you can use them together on their own without Polymer. Um, but it's pretty hard. There's a lot of boilerplate or, you know, relatively greater boilerplate. Um, and there's a lot of tricks and gaps and things. You know, but Polymer's entire goal is to make that way easier. So Polymer is also opinionated. Like the lower level parts of the stack are supposed to be standards and not have an opinion. Polymer is where we're expressing our opinion about how this stuff should be used. But it's not going to be the only one. Um, these are just conventions. And this is our opinion. Everyone else is going to have a different one. You know, this is the web component shipping is kind of a big inflection point in web development. Um, and things that came before and things that came after it are going to look really, really different. And we're just kind of one of the first ones out there, but we aren't going to be one of the only ones out there. So we talk about being opinionated, what's our opinion? So there's a couple like key principles. This is what our philosophy is. Um, so the first one is components all the way down. So you know, separation of concerns is a key to scalable applications. So if a developer can focus on a, on a small piece of functionality that has one function and, and really, really tight um, scoping, uh, then that's, and you build things out of bigger and bigger elements, so reusable components compose into bigger ones, which compose into bigger ones, which compose into bigger ones. Um, that's a way to build scalable applications. And scoping provided by Shadow DOM kind of enables this composition, which Eric talked to. So everything is an element is kind of something we talk about a lot. So custom elements are our component model. I mentioned that before. And we use them absolutely everywhere. So we have UI elements. I showed, showed you some of those. We have APIs. We have the Firebase element. Eric showed you that. Um, even data. Like we, we figured out a little while ago, we started pushing this idea even further. You know, why have your data in JSON, which is kind of the, the greatest format. If you had it in an element, you can do data binding. You can do all these cool things with it um, that we hadn't really thought about before. So we're a little crazy in that regard. We're pushing it pretty hard. And finally, the last philosophical piece is just uh, less code. So don't repeat yourself is kind of our mantra. Um, the, the goal is we, don't want, we want developers only to write code that's unique to their own application. Um, and data binding is a big key to that. As you saw in the application that I built, there was no JavaScript code being written, yet it was still a really functional application. All right, so there's a bunch of stuff we talk about as Polymer. 
Uh, the bottom layer here is the native browser landscape. And in reality, you guys know this is a pretty uneven landscape. Uh, it changes all the time from browser to browser and from version to version. So in reality, this is a pretty rough thing. So we build this platform layer on top of it. So this is platform JS, which I'll show you. Um, so this is the set of polyfills, again, that aren't Polymer, but that smooth that over and allow you to write to an even constant surface um, that's going to go away over time. So the goal is, you know, in a few years, this platform thing is the box is gone completely. It's all part of the native thing below. Oops. Uh, finally, Polymer is a thin layer in the middle, and that's where we express our opinion and how we work with these things. We've talked about that. And then elements are the you know, masses of things that are built on top of all of these technologies. So when we talk about um, Polymer, Polymer is a tool for building elements. There's really two ways that breaks down, um, and that's using elements and creating elements. So the vast majority of people that are going to use web components are going to go, you know, aren't going to be sophisticated developers. And they're going to take, you know, they're going to find a calendar widget, like the DHTML calendar widget that is used on every single website from the history of time. Um, they're going to want to plop it on their page. And they're not really going to want to do a lot with it. Um, but people in this room who are more sophisticated web developers are going to be obviously more interested in creating their own. Um, so I'll cover the first one uh, really, really quickly. So we have a bunch of UI elements. Eric showed you some of these. Um, we're using the core dash uh, nomenclature. We started using Polymer dash for everything. And then all of a sudden, everyone started making Polymer elements. And they named all their things Polymer dash. Uh, so we're trying to kind of show that these things are just namespaces, right? We're saying these are you know, really highly functional things um, that don't have a lot of opinion in them that are just generally useful. So we're calling them core elements. And then a bunch of non-visual elements. Firebase is in there somewhere at the bottom. Um, yeah, so a lot of things that wrap APIs. And we're really discovering, you know, people on Chrome are realizing that, that a way of, of making your APIs um, a lot more user friendly and developer friendly is by wrapping them in, in uh, element wrappers. So Polymer actually already has well over 100 elements. Uh, there'll be a lot more soon. We're kind of just turning to work on this really heavily. And there's just a few steps you need to use to do it. So first one is to just get the code somehow. Uh, we tend to use Bower on the team, but it's not a requirement. You can, we have zip files. You can use, use GitHub. We have a script that pulls down every single element we have called pull all. Um, but you know, Bower install is pretty cool. We've got Bower files for Bower.json files for everything that pull down the dependencies and a big flat list. That's pretty cool. Um, then in your HTML file, you include platform.js. This is what gives you the magic and gives you the polyfills. Uh, then you import the element that you want to use using link rel import. It's an HTML import. And then you just use it. Um, and that's really all you have to do. And all of a sudden, the thing just works. You don't have to install Polymer. You don't have to pull that down. It's a dependency of the element. So it pulls it down for you. So there's a few things that we do in Polymer to make creating elements easier. Uh, so this is a basic Polymer element. This is creates an element called my-element, which we use all over the place. Um, and this is kind of the most basic thing you're going to see, right? It's got a template. Inside the template is the HTML that gets stamped out when this element's instantiated. So in this case, it's just got some CSS and some HTML, and this is the result. So I can inspect this in DevTools like Eric did, and you can see that it's a, a my-dash element. But if you want to do more than that, which of course you do, you're going to add a prototype. So just by using this Polymer um, function, you're creating a prototype, and you can add some functionality and interactivity to this element. So in this case, when I click on this guy, he says, howdy, folks. <coughs> and data binding is, again, a really big piece of Polymer. So in this case, we've got the same, same element, but we've added a property on the prototype of owner and given it a name Rob because I stole these slides from him. And then in the, the, you know, in the actual HTML, you can use the double mustache syntax with that property name. And it'll stamp out Rob in that case. Um, and if you do this in a property, it'll be two-way and things like that. It's pretty cool. Um, but what if you want to expose it? We have publish properties. So in this case, if you put it in the attributes attribute, then all of a sudden, the person who uses the, owner el uses the element can specify an owner that overrides this default owner, Rob, and says, Alex built me with Polymer. So there's a bunch of other features to Polymer. Um, it's all on our website in various places. I'm not going to bore you to death with all of it. Um, but those are kind of just the basic pieces. So the first question, or 80% you know, of the questions we get tend to be, how do I use this with something? Either some tool or some framework that you're familiar with today. Um, and there's kind of a, a pretty simple way to talk about this. Eric touched on it a little bit as well. 
So polymer elements are just custom elements. And I put just in quotes because custom elements are honestly pretty cool. Um, and this is what makes it special. And we like to think about it in a, in a, in a thinking about the element boundary. So elements are scoped using Shadow DOM. So there's this boundary a border around the entire element. And so outside that element, if you're looking in, it looks just like a DOM element. Like Eric showed, you can use this in any other framework today or on any other page. Um, you know, so long as you have platform JS and it's, it's using web components, you can just use this like you use a select tag. And it exposes properties, events, and methods exactly as normal. Inside the element boundary, it's a different world, right? That's where you get all the polymer goodies. That's where you get data binding. And none of that stuff leaks out. IDs don't leak out. CSS doesn't leak out. Scoping doesn't leak out. None of that. So this lets us play really, really nicely with a lot of other projects. Um, so kind of the takeaway from this is this is a really, really big new thing. It's kind of the beginning of a new era or a revolution. <laughs> uh, so we're bootstrapping this ecosystem, and it's really for everyone to use, right? This is we're part of the Chrome team. We work on web standards. This is really for absolutely everyone. We've created one opinion with Polymer, but we expect others to be out there. And what's, what's really important is that you guys all learn to use web components and kind of learn the power that it's providing. Um, we're building catalog, we're building catalogs, we're building documentation standards, you know, there's new ways to distribute your elements, tooling, all that stuff is stuff we're working on out in, in, in public. We've been on, on GitHub fully public from day one. And we're kind of moving on all these fronts at once, and we're just a really little team. So let me tell you where we're going. It's pretty simple. So we're in alpha right now. We abused the fact that we were in pre-alpha for a really long time because these standards were changing quite a bit. Uh, we're going to be in beta once the native features ship in one browser. So it looks like that browser is going to be Chrome 36, which is Canary right now. Uh, that's going to branch into beta in, I think, about two more weeks. Uh, so in about 12 weeks when that reaches the public channel, or yeah, six weeks, when that, seven weeks when that reaches the public channel, uh, that's when this stuff will be finally native in one browser. Uh, we'll probably, you know, as long as everything's stable, flip the label to beta at that point. And finally, how can you guys help? Uh, so go to Polymer Project and read more. Uh, you can write to us on Twitter, or you can write to me, the actor, on Twitter. You can write us something bigger. Go to Stack Overflow. That's where we like to push all the questions to so everyone can see them. Um, and build something. Write an element. Like we wrote that Firebase element for the Firebase guys here. <laughs> so you know, write an element. If you've got an API, odds are you know something you want to expose via a custom element. And this is a green field right now. If you build something and share it, a lot of people will see it. You'll be kind of one of the first people out there. You know, wrap an API and share it with the world um, and join our revolution. And then check back soon because we're going to be at Google I.O. Uh, it's about a short, short six or seven weeks away at this point. As Eric and I shake our heads, <laughs> um, we'll be there. So check us out at Polymer. Thanks. Yeah, so um, this actually is a much more nuanced question, answer than that. It, uh, you know, using the polyfills, it works everywhere. Um, different native features are available on different browsers. So uh, everything but HTML imports and object.observe are in Chrome 35. Chrome 36 has those last two things. So, and then Firefox supports uh, custom elements uh, and are working on the other pieces. Template, template tag too. Uh, yeah, so you know, we've, we're using Bower for everything right now, uh, with, and you know, we're working on working with that team to kind of change it to be a little bit more component friendly. Um, but I think that's the, that's the goal for us right now is to standardize on Bower because um, it's just a you know the the whole point of this is it doesn't really doesn't provide any new toys, so you can actually just work with the existing stuff. So the npm guys ping us quite a bit about supporting npm as well, but right now we're on Bower. Yeah, there, there's been some enthusiastic developers that put stuff on npm, so the polyfills in particular. Uh, but we're kind of investing in Bower right now just because we think that is a, a really awesome solution for a package manager, um, which would, like Matt said, bring, bring down dependencies. If you don't have to worry, if you want to install core Ajax or core Firebase or something, you just install that and you use it, which is really nice. Sure, that's a good question. So to summarize the question for the stream and everything else, uh, the question is, you know, Google has Angular, Google has Polymer. Uh, what's the future of kind of both of those together? They're different projects, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I put Angular, I put in that category of really, really awesome JavaScript frameworks that are out today. Uh, Polymer is kind of a different thing and in the future. Angular has announced that their Angular 2.0 is going to be heading more towards a web components feature. And I think we have to see how that's going to evolve. Uh, we do talk with them, um, but right now I think, you know, 
by necessity, because they're very, very popular, they're kind of focused on today and we're focused kind of on the future. Let me, let me answer each question at a time or else we'll forget. Uh, so the first one is about dependency management. So a couple things. So uh, we are using Bower for, to, to define dependencies. Um, and then for when multiple things depend on the same, same uh, import, HTML imports dedupe based on uh, URL. So if it's exact URL. So as long as you're not putting the same dependency across different CDNs or something like that, the browser will just take care of it for you and will only import it once. Okay, question two. Uh, yeah, so the question is, can you put images inside web components? And yes, you can put anything, anything you want. So we've we've been working, we're working with Canvas today in a web component. Gotcha. That all just works. That's one of the is you can package up anything that the web platform already has, whether it be an API, whether it be some markups, some CSS, iframes, Canvas, object tech, whatever you want. Like you can package that up, and then people and then can use that. Those images. Uh, yeah, so the images are contained within the shadow DOM of the component. So they're part of it. I mean, you could still reference an external yep. image on a, on a server if you wanted to, right? It doesn't have to be part of the local package, but... Yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's in the rendered DOM, it's part of the local piece, but it's, it's still just an image tag. Yeah, so we're totally open source, so that's sitting there in a repo called Designer, uh, and you can pull that down using Bower, and it will just work. Uh, we're working on trying to, to stand up a version of it. Um, stay tuned, literally, within maybe the next week or so. Can you it, yourself? Yeah, so the question is, you know, can components contain other components, and where does that stop? Um, so yes, absolutely. Everything I was creating today was components inside of components, and where does it stop? It's kind of up to you, right? So it's wherever it makes sense. And generally, um, you know, one rule of thumb we use is whether something can possibly be reused. Um, so if it's reusable, you kind of want it to be a component. If it's not going to be reusable, you want it to be out in the, in the light DOM, kind of on the, on the index page. We also, so somewhat tangential, we have a tool. It's called Vulcanize. It's, it's basically our, our build tool for web components. And since tooling is totally new for all this new stuff, uh, we, we built something in Node that does this. Um, and basically what it does is, is it takes a list of, like, if your component depends on, like, three other components, it takes all that, crushes it into a single file. So if you're worried about, you know, network requests and that sort of thing, that, that's our current recommendation for like a build, a build system for components. Uh, the question uh, was what about uh, less and SAS and Yeah, so, so SAS and the pre-process language and stuff. Uh, the way I like to think of this is, is all of your web development best practices don't change, or and it, some of the tools you use don't change. So what Matt didn't show, you saw like an inline style tag for styling, an inline strip, script tag that called the Polymer constructor. You can actually reference like a, an external JS file. Uh, you can reference an external you know, CSS file. So if you want to, you can totally write you know, your Polymer code in CoffeeScript. You can totally write your CSS in SAS and then compile that down and reference that in your element. Uh, yeah, so what's the biggest uh, barrier to adoption? Um, so the bar ba biggest barrier to adoption is uh, browser compatibility. Uh, so the polyfills are our answer to that. Um, you know, again, performance is not ideal in a polyfill, and that's kind of not the point. Um, but really, honestly, web components are everyone who's tried it uh, just thought it's pretty awesome. We've gotten very, very little blowback at all from, from people that have seen it before. Uh, so we're pretty confident that we've, we're onto the right thing. Yeah, so how does, how does restyling work? So it works just like any other DOM element. Um, so there are special CSS selectors in order to pierce the shadow DOM boundary. Uh, so you can use that to, to basically theme anything with CSS that you want to do today. Yeah, the question is, would you, is this something as a component author you'd expose, like which things to restyle? Um, yeah, so you can do a lot of things, right? You can expose things as, as properties, right, and methods, and, and do things that way. Um, so you can expose an API that way. Um, and there's also CSS variables, which are kind of an emerging standard to handle some of this stuff as well. Um, but uh, yeah, and then all else fails, obviously, the, uh, you know, the CSS selectors can do whatever they want on a page just like today. So you could use, you could create custom attributes that then you could put on your element that people could then use for styling purposes. You can also use what Matt said, which we didn't really cover at all, is like you can still poke. So Shadow Dump doesn't really like, it doesn't block you from everything, right? As a developer, you can totally still hack, you can totally still poke around, get at stuff inside if you need to, right? You can, ultimately, we, we always need to tweak at some point. Um, so there are selectors for that. You can, you can basically style, like you can get at an ID, for instance, or a class inside of the, the Shadow Dump, the component Shadow Dump. Okay, cool. So let's thank uh, the presenters. Cool.